So we've been in a series, uh, Following the Lamb, we've called it, and really we're just looking at this thread that runs through the Bible of lambs being slain and the significance of what that means. And as Christian people who read and study the Word of God, do you guys do that? I mean, what's the point of me being up here if you don't do that, right? I'm not, I'm not your, your feeding trough. Feed yourselves, right? As Christian people who read and study the Word of God, all right, it's easy to start speaking Christianese especially when you've been reading the Bible for a long time. And we actually forget how our own words can confuse others that are newer to the Bible. And sometimes we talk over people's heads without even knowing it. I mean, I knew this morning we had a lot of songs about the blood. And that was on purpose, not for what I'm about to say, but because we're gonna have communion this morning. And most of us know what that means in those phrases, but someone walks into our church and we start talking about sacrificial lambs. And the blood of the lamb saving us, we plead the blood over our families. We thank him for the blood applied. And all this blood and sacrifice talk can come off a little weird to somebody who may not know what it means. Even for those who have been in church for a while but just haven't come into the understanding of it all. And that's really the purpose of this series. I I, I want us to be a church that's full of people who understand that the shed blood of Jesus not only washes our sins away, but it is our very life. It's our very life. I want us to comprehend, even if just a little bit, what Jesus actually did for us when he sacrificially died on that cross. You know, the the life of a creature is in the blood. There's no forgiveness without the shedding of blood. Both of those statements are in scriptures. We must understand the importance of shed blood if we're gonna understand all that Jesus says we are and who we are in him. Because I'm telling you, church, if you understand that, it changes everything. It changes everything. Blood is a substance that can't be manufactured. It's a creation of God. With all of our medical knowledge and understanding of human anatomy, nobody really knows how blood does what it does. They can analyze it, categorize it, and even know its chemical makeup, but that's where the understanding kind of comes to an end. How does it give life? How does it do that? When someone receives a heart transplant, The doctors clamp off the arteries, take out the old heart, and they take the new heart, which has been on ice, and and they put it in, sew the arteries in, and then unclamp it, and the blood that's in the body, when it goes through, uh, through those arteries that have just been newly sewn, where the heart has been placed in there, and that blood hits the heart, that heart instantly starts beating. I don't know if you knew that, that's true. They don't have to shock it back to to get it going again. When blood hits it, it starts pumping, and nobody really knows why. We serve a God who's pretty incredible. And no matter how much we try to figure him out, you're not gonna be able to figure him out. Just submit to his incredible nature and who he is and, and, and let it be, right? He's bigger than us. He knows more than us. Knowledge is great. But we know nothing compared to the God we serve. The sacrificial blood of Jesus that was shed on the cross, it gives us life spiritually, just like physical blood has life-giving properties that give our physical bodies life. And because we're leading up to Easter Sunday, we've really been covering sacrificial lambs and, and, and more specifically the connection that exists between the first Passover and the crucifixion of Christ. And those were, are two events that, are, that happened over 1,460 years apart from one another, but are linked together forever. And if we understand them, we will have a greater understanding of God's plan of salvation for us. So just in a quick review, let's talk about that first Passover. The Israelites, they've been enslaved for 400 years in Egypt. They've been worked, they've been beaten, they've been abused. For 400 years, they have been there under Pharaoh's hand. And they, uh, they were without freedom. They were in bondage, slaves. 
And then God raised up Moses, as you know, and he, and he uh, through Moses, he led his people out of Egypt. And he did that by sending, God sent 10 plagues. How many know about the 10 plagues? All their water turned to blood, frogs. Can you imagine? Thousands upon thousands upon hundreds of thousands of frogs. Gross. Lice. That's a great plague, isn't it? Flies. Thought the Warren County Fair, when it gets over, there's a lot of flies. You thought that was bad. I'm telling you, this was different. Flies. Livestock disease where all their livestock was dying. Boils that came upon the people. Horrible boils. Wouldn't you love that? Just an outbreak of boils on everybody. Hail, locusts. I think this year is the year of the cicada. Maybe we'll understand a little bit from what they're saying. It's going to be cataclysmic. I'm going to stand in my yard and rebuke the locusts in the name of Jesus <laughs> and the cicadas. And if I see any of you eating one of them online, I'm going to talk to you. So that's just wrong. People do that. It's weird. And then there was, the, the, of course, the plague of darkness. All horrible stuff. And yet Pharaoh would not let the Israelites go. He just was so hard in his heart. He would not let them go. And then the final plague that won them their freedom, the death of the firstborn of all of Egypt. God gave instructions to the Jews, the Israelites, to his people, to take a male lamb without defect into their home on 10 Nisan and care for it. They were to slaughter it on 14 Nisan. Nisan's the Jewish month. Apply some of its blood on the doorposts of their homes. Then they were to roast the lamb and eat it with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. And this was to be a lasting ordinance for them. That's what we've gone over so far. And you can read about all this in the first 15 chapters of the book of Exodus. Last week, we really zeroed in on how they were to eat bread made without yeast during the entire Passover celebration. Not just then, but for every Passover, every year since then. And we even got into how they prepared and their, their, for, for that Passover meal. They literally had to cleanse their house of yeast and even any residue that may have existed from the yeast being used. And we call it Passover. God called it Passover because when that plague came to the Egyptians of the death of the firstborn, when he saw the blood on the doorposts of, their, of the Israelites' homes, he passed over them. The blood caused the Lord, the angel of the Lord, to pass over, and then their household was not inflicted with that horrible plague of the death of the firstborn. And yeast, of course, we got into talking about it, is a leavening agent that, that, and just a little bit of it works throughout a batch of dough, causing it to rise, very much like sin works in someone's life. Jesus made those connections. We looked at that last week. And if you've ever baked bread, you understand this process of adding leaven uh, to the dough and getting it to expand. And a, what a picture, right? A little bit of sin in our life just expands and it begins to take over our lives. And it's easy to read all that stuff and ask, why does this matter to me? And why was God so detailed in his instructions regarding the Passover? Because there was a lot of instructions. And you have to understand that the first Passover meal was a picture of what was to come. It was a picture, a foreshadowing of what was to come. So fast forward to the time of Jesus' crucifixion, crucifixion. Jesus was the Lamb of God, right? John the Baptist made this clear when he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus is welcomed into the city of Jerusalem as he enters it on 10 Nisan. This is the same day that the Jewish families are welcoming their Passover lambs into their houses. And as tradition dictates, the people were removing yeast from their homes during this time. And what does Jesus do? He goes immediately to his father's house, the temple, and he cleanses it from the sinful acts of the money changers and those who had turned the temple into a marketplace. This is the last two weeks. If you haven't listened to that, if you weren't here, if you missed it, go back and watch them on YouTube. This is some technical stuff. It's hard to get all of it into one sermon. But yeast, again, is a picture of sin. That was the point of the Jews getting rid of all things that had yeast in them, as well as cleaning everything that yeast came in contact with. So this morning, I want to talk about the rest of that Passover meal they were instructed to eat during the first Passover in Egypt, and understand that this was the same meal, pretty much. I mean, there were some nuances that were changed a little bit, but pretty much the same meal that Jesus longed to share with his disciples. Jesus was a Jew. He followed the religious traditions of the Jews, and he celebrated the Passover meal as a lasting ordinance as God's people were commanded. He did this 
His whole life, every year, he was a part of Passover. But this one was different. This meal and how they ate it, again, it remained basically the same since the first Passover in Egypt. Every part of it was to commemorate what God had done for them and how he'd purchased their freedom through the applied blood of the Passover lambs each home had sacrificed. So I want you to turn to Luke 22, 7 through 12. Turn to your neighbor and, and say, okay, get ready. That was a lot of review, I know. Get ready. Get ready. Here we go. Luke 22, 7 through 12. Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. This is obviously in the time of Jesus. Verse 8, Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare for it? They asked. He replied, as you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters and say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, where's the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, all furnished, make preparations there. Boy, isn't that a great way to, uh, to just uh, reserve a room, you know? Just what a, that's got, that's got the internet and, and uh, you know, what are the, what are the booking uh, online websites? I don't, I can't even remember all of them now, but this is a lot better. Just, hey, go see that guy who's carrying water. There's going to be a guy carrying water and he'll get you all set up. Uh, Jesus is awesome that way. Um, Luke 22, 13 through 16, they left and found things just as Jesus had told them. Big surprise, right? So they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. This was Jesus' final Passover meal with his disciples, we call it the Last Supper. Here are some of the foods that would have been included in that meal. Unleavened bread. We commonly call it matzah. It symbolized the haste with which the Israelites left Egypt during the Exodus. The moment Pharaoh let them go, they had to go. Understand that. The moment Pharaoh said go, they had to go. They couldn't wait for their bread to rise. During that first Passover meal, God had even instructed them on how they were to eat it. And listen to this, Exodus 12, 11. This is how you are to eat it, with your cloak tucked in your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. They were to be ready at a moment's notice to pick up and leave that place they had lived their whole lives. It's talking about the, the Israelites in, in Egypt. God knew they needed to get away quick. And it makes me think of some scriptures. Fast forward to today. You know, 2 Corinthians 6.2b says, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, today is the day, or now is the day of salvation. You know, when God starts calling you to get right with him, don't wait around, be ready, and just do it. Amen. Right? Today is the day of salvation. There's no time to consider what you're going to do, just like there was no time for the Israelites to think about whether or not they wanted to leave the bondage they were in. Hmm, I wonder if I should do this thing that Moses is talking about. Hmm, I just saw all these plagues come upon Egypt. And I saw all these miraculous things. I, I wonder if I should just stay in my house. It's comfortable here. I wonder if I should stay in bondage. And we think that's crazy talk, but we do the very same thing when reference to our sin. Hmm, I wonder if I want to stay in bondage to my sin or if I want to walk in deliverance and freedom. Yeah. Today is the day of freedom. 2 Corinthians 6, 17a says this, therefore come out from them, uh, among them and be separate, says the Lord. I, it's like a just do it kind of thing, Right? Today is the day to leave the bondage of Egypt behind. Don't even think twice. Just come out and be separate. Matzah is also quickly cooked at high temperatures. It's unleavened. We just talked about that. But not leaving any time for it to rise. Um, during this fast baking process, it gets lines on it. Show a picture of the matzah here. Yeah, there it is. You see kind of the lines, the burnt lines through there? It gets lines on it, and it's often pierced to make sure no air bubbles form because they don't even want it to have the appearance of having a leavening, leavening agent. And if an air bubble forms, it, that air bubble rises, right? They don't even want that. So it's pierced. And scriptures never tell us that unleavened bread was to be striped and pierced 
But it just always seems to have those characteristics in the way they prepare it. Possibly another foreshadowing of what would happen to our Passover lamb, Jesus Christ. Isaiah 53, 4 through 5 says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did, we, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded or pierced for our transgressions. Pierced. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Was the matzah bread a picture of what would be? It's unbelievable to me that those things don't seem like they're just happenstance, right? And speaking of healing, by his stripes we are healed. Speaking of healing, this is in reference, I want to read a scripture to you, it's in reference to the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt. It says this, Psalm 105, 37. It's kind of an obscure scripture, but it's talking about the Israelites. This, this psalm is, and, and, and how they were in bondage. And he says, he also brought them out with silver and gold. And it says, and there was none feeble among his tribes. Now, that is an incredible verse. It doesn't say it anywhere else, but it says it in Psalms there. The psalmist brings that out. And, and we believe that it was true because it's in the word of God. And the word of God is truth, Amen. amen. What am I saying? It's estimated that there were, or could have been, as many as two to three million people involved in the exodus of the Israelites out of Egypt. Two to three million people. They had been in slavery for 400 years. They'd been beaten, abused, forced to work in horrible conditions. And there were no feeble among them, the scripture says. There was no cripples. There was no people who couldn't walk out of two to three million people. How is that possible? Well, maybe the psalmist just wasn't telling the truth. I don't believe that that's the case. Could it be that when they partook of the sacrificial Passover lamb, when they ate that roasted lamb, when they consumed it, that they were all healed? I, I can't prove it. But I believe this is another foreshadowing of the power of blood, the power of the blood of our Passover lamb. When we partake of him, when we receive him into our lives, healing is available for us. Matzah bread, unleavened bread. They also would have ate bitter herbs. Traditionally, these would have included horseradish greens and romaine lettuce, endives, chicory. Everybody say chicory. I don't know why I did that. I just think it's fun to say chicory. Or parsley. All of these are leafy, bitter herbs, and they ate them without ranch dressing. That... That means there was a bitter taste in their mouth when they ate them. And this bitter salad of herbs had a purpose. It symbolized the bitterness and harshness of slavery that they had endured. It reminded them then and for generations to come of what their Jewish ancestry, ancestors had to go through. And again, it, it was a foreshadowing of the bitterness and harshness of the crucifixion of Jesus. See, these things happen in Scripture in the Old Testament, and they point to what's going to take place later. And they're prophetic, and Jesus fulfilled those prophecies over and over and over again. I mean, the Roman crucifixion was no joke. It was bitter. It was harsh. It was pure brutality. And we know Jesus suffered to an even uh, greater degree than any other as he not only bore the physical pain of the whipping post with the cat of nine tails. So he goes, what's a cat of nine tails? It's a special whip with nine little things coming out of it and they had woven into the leather chips of bone and glass or anything they could find that was sharp and they would whip and they would, the guy was so masterful, the Roman soldier who used it was so masterful, he could whip it and, and actually get it to stick in the flesh and then he'd rip the flesh off as he pulled it back. That's what Jesus endured. The carrying of the cross on his ripped up back, because his back was ripped after that. They put that big old beam on his back. Can you imagine? I mean, we know he endured physical pain. And the nailing of his hands and feet, ouch, right? We know that that hurt, had to have. And I don't know, right through here, through the wrists, right through there, and then one through the feet, right through the top, shattering bone and going through muscle and ouch, can't imagine it. But you know, he also bore the emotional and spiritual pain 
of taking away the sins of the world. He became the object of suffering to pay the price for every one of our sins. A bitter harshness to that. I was talking with uh, Tiffany Money a couple of weeks ago, and um, sometimes people just catch me in the foyer, or they, they stop in the office and they, they have a thought, and she had a comment, and then she made this comment, which I, I thought was awesome, but um, that when Jesus bore the weight of the world's sins, he would have felt things that he had never felt before, and I actually had never thought about this. Um, he, he would have felt things that he had never felt before. He lived a sinless life, amen? He never sinned. He never made a mistake. He was perfect. He lived a sinless life. So he had never felt guilt or shame. Do you know how many things that we do and ways we behave because we feel guilt and shame? He never felt any of that his entire life. And now as he hangs on the cross and he becomes the object of the punishment of sin, he feels the weight of the world's guilt and shame all at once. How many know guilt doesn't feel good? Shame feels really terrible. All of the world's past, present, and future, all on him, all at once. And when we think of the apostles and how they were put to death for their faith, again, a bitter end to a life lived for Jesus, not to mention every person that's ever been martyred for the name of Jesus Christ, the horrific atrocities that have been committed against Christians in that Jewish Passover meal. There, there's even a foreshadowing of the persecution that was to come for those that would take on the name of Jesus and identify as Christians. Church, we live in a great country. It's, it's free, and we don't get persecuted all that much. I mean, we might get laughed at once in a while or, or, or argued with or something like that, but that, that's really not persecution compared to what some people go through. There's people dying all over the world right now for the name of Jesus Christ. There's more martyrs happening right now than there's ever been. People dying, being put to death, being tortured for the name of Christ. There's a bitterness to it. These bitter herbs meant something. Not just for them in remembering what was and in Egypt, in the slavery, and the harshness that they were treated, but in the future Savior who would die a horrific death, and even for us or those that believed in the name of Jesus and were persecuted for him. It's bitter. It's bitter. Three, they would have ate a roasted lamb. They ate matzah bread, they ate bitter herbs, and they would have ate, a, ate roasted lamb. Obviously, this was the Passover lamb. And of course, it symbolized the blood sacrifice made during the first Passover in Egypt and obviously pointed to Jesus as the sacrificial lamb of God. That's an easy one to see. One of the interesting things about the Passover lamb is that they were instructed not to break any of its bones as they prepared it. Exodus 12, 46 and 47 says this, it must be eaten. These are instructions that the Lord gave the Israelites in the original Passover, the first Passover. It must be eaten inside the house. Take none of the meat outside the house. Do not break any of the bones. I mean, it would have been easier to take it apart a little bit so you could roast the whole thing, get it in your, I don't know, this is my weird thinking, but to get it in the pan, right? You know, but they had to roast it whole. There's a reason for that. They were instructed specifically to not break any of its bones as they prepared it. The whole community, he says in verse 47, of Israel must celebrate, the, must celebrate it. Why would God instruct them to not break the bones? Well, for the Israelites, it was symbolic of their sacrifice being complete. It represented the integrity of their sacrifice. It spoke of the wholeness and perfection of their lamb. Fast forward to the time of Jesus and the Passover celebration he was having with his disciples. John 19, 30 through 34. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. This is, this is on the cross. With that, he bowed, he, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now it was the day of preparation and the next day was to be a special Sabbath because the Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath. So they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. This was common practice. Verse 32, the soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. 
Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. So God instructed 1,460 years previous to this, 60 plus years, to this, don't break any bones. Don't break the bones of that sacrificial Passover lamb. Fast forward again to the time of Jesus on the cross. Common practice was to break the legs They came by, he was already dead, they didn't have to break the legs. Why would they break the legs in Roman crucifixion? Because if they could stand even a little bit once in a while up on their nailed feet or you know, uh, bound feet, some were tied, some were nailed, I, diff- they did it different ways, but they could stand up, they could breathe. With their arms out like this and their feet, they could breathe a little bit and catch some oxygen. With their legs broken, they would hang and they, they wouldn't be able to breathe very long. So it was a quicker death, in other words. Let them hang there a while, we'll break their legs, and then they'll, then they'll die pretty quickly, kind of thing. When they came to Jesus, he was already dead. I wonder if the weight of your sin and my sin and the sin of the world, I wonder if that weight was the reason he died so quickly. And I, I'm sure it is. John 19.36 says this, these things happened, as far as this is the scripture, about Jesus already being dead. It says these things happen so the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. Jesus couldn't make that happen on his own. Nobody could. Why does this matter? Because Jesus fulfilled the prophecies that were written about the coming Messiah. And I know most of us believe that in here today. He fulfilled them in his life. He fulfilled them through his death and his resurrection, and he will fulfill them in his return. Why does it matter? I got to tell you, it's because Jesus is who he says he is. He is who he said he was, right? That means everything he said was true. That means our lives must line up with him and his word. The ramifications of Jesus fulfilling prophecy, I mean, with his life, death, burial, resurrection, and soon coming king, right? The prophecies he's fulfilled screams at us today that everything he said was true. And for us to kind of go through, and we're good at this, whether we know it or not, we're good at this. We like the scripture we like. It, it, we, we don't like the scripture we don't like because it's kind of hard on us. So we, we, we read it, we're, we go, yeah, we know God, that's good. But then we go back to the ones we like. We camp out there, right? It's like this spiritual smorgasbord. You take what you want, a smorgasbord is a buffet, by the way, for you young'uns. So does anybody use that word anymore, smorgasbord? Turn to your neighbor and say smorgasbord. Yeah. <laughs> A spiritual buffet that you walk through, you're like, I'll take some of that. I'll, I'm going to leave that. I don't like that. It's like it's, there's some things in the Word of God to us that are kind of like the pickled herring on the, on the, uh, on the buffet, right? We're not going to eat that. I would. I love pickled herring. Don't bring me pickled herring, okay? That, I say stuff like that, and then I start getting bunches of it, and it's too much. We can't pick and choose what we're going to do or what we're going to take, what we're going to listen to, what we're going to apply to our life. We take the whole word of God because Jesus, if he says, if, if, if who he says he was is true, then we take the whole thing. We don't pick and choose. It's the word of God becomes our source. We don't try to line the word of God up with how we want to live. We line our life up with what it says. End of story, period. There is no exceptions, right? It's so important we understand that. You either believe everything he said and you live accordingly or you don't believe. We must repent and submit our lives to him. It's not a one foot in and a one foot out kind of thing. I mean, there's no time for spiritual hokey pokey, right? You put your one foot in, you put your one foot out. That's not how the church is. That's not how Jesus, having a relationship with Jesus should be. Today is the day of salvation. Choose this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, I'm gonna serve the Lord right? So roasted lamb. Four, what else did they eat? Carol set. 
It's a sweet mixture of fruits, nuts, and wine. And this was, was and still is eaten during the Passover meal. And, and to the Jew, it symbolizes the mortar used by the Israelites in building the massive structures they built while they were enslaved in Egypt. Some of you have heard of the Passover meal referred to as the Seder meal. Most of us probably have. Seder means order or arrangement. And this name was given in reference to the Passover meal probably a couple hundred years after Jesus. But it's really a fitting name because, it, 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 uh, because of the detail and attention that's given to the meal, right? It's so orderly and there's so many details in it. There's an incredible order to it. Mortar is used to hold bricks together. It's not, is that obvious? I mean, it's what it is, right? It combines various ingredients to create a cohesive mixture that bonds the bricks together, unifying the structure as one. Karoset has a sweet flavor and is meant to be a reminder of that mortar, but that even in times of hardship and suffering, there can be moments of joy, hope, peace, and unity. And again, there's so many prophetic pictures here. How, how many know that Jesus is your mortar? I mean, he's the one that holds us together, right? We're all part of his body. You're a brick. I, turn to your neighbor and say, you're a brick. That's just too much fun. I can't pass that one up. And I'm a brick, right? You're a brick and I'm a brick. And he's the mortar that holds us all together as the body of Christ. He holds us together. And even though we may go through challenging times in this life, hardships and difficulties, we have the sweetness of fellowship with our brothers and sisters in the body of Christ that bonds us together. We can have joy, hope, peace, and unity in the midst of it all because Christ is holding us all together. I love that. Now, in the Passover meal that the Jews celebrated way back then, they weren't thinking about all that. But these things not only have, had meaning for them, but they had meaning for future generations to come. And they point to the future. Number five, they drank wine. Red wine represented the blood of the Passover lamb. It symbolized the joy and freedom that exists through the sacrificial death of the Passover lamb. The, the Israelites obtained total freedom through that blood. When that blood or when that lamb was slain and they took that blood and they put it on the doorpost of their heart, the, the angel of death passed over them and that blood is what purchased their freedom, literally. Literally. What joy they must have felt when Pharaoh let them go. It's interesting to note that when you follow the story of the Israelites being led into the wilderness, they did have this thing, this reoccurring thing, where they, they, keep, they kept falling into longing for Egypt in their hearts. Why would anyone go back to the slavery of Egypt? Why, why would they do that? Why would they say, we were better off in Egypt, at least we had homes and you know, blah, blah, blah. But we do the same thing when we allow those sinful desires to entice us back into the sin we've been set free from. Don't go back to the slavery of Egypt or the bondage of sin. Don't go back to that. Your freedom has been purchased through the blood of the lamb. The wine consumed at Passover reminded the Jew to walk in the joy of their freedom. And church, the blood of Jesus, for us, applied to our lives, accepted as the blood sacrifice for our sins, we should be reminded every time we take communion, and we're gonna get into that in just a second, every time, that we should walk in the freedom and the joy of that freedom. Because he saved us from sin. He set us free. We don't have to live in that place any longer. So let's follow the Passover lamb, Jesus, into the upper room where he shared the Last Supper. And I know I'm hopping all over the place, back and forth and back and forth, but I just wanted you to see the connections. This is where he shared the Last Supper, the last Passover meal that he would have with his disciples and in his words, until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. The disciples, uh, they arrived at the upper room where they were gonna share the special meal and as it's being served, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, Jesus, he gets up from the table, takes off his outer clothes and he wraps the servant's towel around his waist pours water into a basin and he gets on his hands and knees and he begins to wash the feet of his closest friends. The savior of the world takes the posture of a servant. It's what took place in that upper room. They begin eating the Passover meal and 
Matthew 26, 26 through 29, we can pick it up there. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Now, Jesus is instituting a new covenant here. It's like in the middle of the Passover meal. He says, here's an illustration. He doesn't say it that way. But he takes a piece of bread and he holds it up. Unleavened bread, because it was Passover, right? There's no yeast in that, no sin. Jesus, as our, you know, he's also called the bread of life, which is interesting. That's a whole whole other thread we haven't even gone down. But no sin in this perfect, sinless life of Jesus. And he breaks it, and he goes through what I just read. And he takes the cup, he does the same thing. He's instituting a new covenant here. It's the covenant of his blood. Upon his death, he would become the Passover lamb for all people for all time. And the disciples didn't understand what he was saying at the moment, but they would eventually get it. And we know that sometime during the meal, Jesus calls out uh, Judas as the one who was going to betray him. And we know that an argument broke out kind of at the same time to which one of them was going to be the greatest in the kingdom. I mean, here's Jesus instituting a new covenant. All the sacrificial stuff was going to be done. Not just the Passover lamb, but all the sin sacrifices. I mean, if you want to get into all those, it's a bloody mess in the Old Testament. The Jewish faith back then was a bloody mess because they knew the importance of blood being sacrificed to atone for our sins. But Jesus was about to wipe that away because he would become the fulfillment, the once and for all fulfillment, so all of that could stop. And again, while he's doing this, they break into this, well, who's going to be greatest? Well, I'm going to be the greatest. You know, I'm, I'm the greatest. I'm considered the greatest follower of Jesus and blah, blah, blah. Isn't that just, isn't that just kind of how it is sometimes? church people. What are you going to do with them, you know? (laughs) Jesus taught them many things that night after they shared the Last Supper, and then they left the upper room and went to pray in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus, he knew it was coming, and he sweat blood. The anguish of it was upon him. He, He felt it. And the disciples, they fell asleep. Jesus was arrested, and you guys know the story, and taken away to be put on trial. It was just a matter of a few hours now before he'd be crucified, and that Lamb of God would be slain for you and for me for all time. That we could have access, so death itself would pass over us, and we could have access to heaven. 